John Wesley uh, said, go not where you're needed, go where you're needed the most. Uh, Dr. Layton Farrell uh, was the senior pastor here at Highland Park Church, and Layton wanted to expand our outreach. So I called the Board of Global Ministries to see where we could go uh, take our resources and so on. I told them that Highland Park Church was one of the better off churches in the world, and it shocked somebody to you know, talk plain to them. And, and so I said, and because of that, um, I wanted the poorest place in the world they got to go, the neediest place, to, the neediest place to go. Well, you know, I thought it'd be a little dark African, so the guy came back to me and said, "That'll be Haiti." The Haiti project started when um, Daddy and um, Ken Dixon decided to really look at what part of the world needed a lot of help. At the time, and maybe still, I don't know, Haiti had the lowest per capita income of any place in the world. In terms of medical need, this was one of the most desperate areas of the world. Well, I had the advantage of watching the medical team work, and I am in awe of the gifts that they have, the skills that they have to help blind people see again. One of the people that I met first was a tailor. He was 46 years old. He'd been a tailor for 30 years. He could no longer thread a needle. Out of a job, gave him a pair of glasses. He resent him his, I didn't know tailors had a needle in their lapel, but he pulled out a needle, <laughs> pulled out thread and threaded this needle, held it up. He was in business. He could earn his living. This was not a very exciting scientific project except he could earn his own living. That was, that was great fun. In 2010, we had a great team, and everything was going great, falling in place. And then the earthquake struck, and our lives were changed forever. Good evening. We have a developing story, a breaking news story tonight. A major earthquake has hit Haiti. Our coverage of the deadly earthquake in Haiti continues. A horrible earthquake which has struck here uh, more than 24 hours ago. Well, the earthquake came on very suddenly. The whole place started shaking. It hit and uh, immediately knocked us to the ground. It was like a huge explosion and didn't even realize what was happening, but it was the earthquake. It scared me, but I, I really didn't have a chance to react. It's the next moment that I recall was waking up underground. I got a phone call from one of the family members of one of the team members. And he wanted to make sure that we were aware that it had happened. So the team was in two, two places, uh, which was not ideal. Um, but everyone that they knew and had accounted for were fine. And that was the text. And that was all we heard. There were six of us in the building, plus an interpreter. I must admit, at that moment in time, I had no particular fear about it. It was just kind of shaking. And then the roof fell in. Uh, we kept having aftershocks, and every time we would have an aftershock, it would shift the weight up against my, you know, your rib cage. And it was frightening because you could breathe less and less, and it, it started to feel really scary. We heard that Dr. Forey uh, was injured. His hand was injured. We knew that um, there were three other injuries, and one uh, injury was um, very severe, and that turned out to be Gene Arnlines. But we knew that people were hurt, and, um, and that is, uh, whew. And that's when the decision was made that uh, we are going down to get them. We're going to get a plane. We're going to take the plane down there. Uh, we're going to take the plane. We're going to get an unlimited 
a flight plan where we go anywhere we want. We're going to get people on that plan, plane who can communicate with the pilot to tell them in flight that we're switching off and going somewhere else. Uh, we're going to get them out. So there was a point um, in the middle of the night before the sun rose that the rest of our team had somehow made it back to the site where we were all kind of camping out on the lawn. We had no outside communication, so we were trying to figure out, do we start walking down to Port-au-Prince? We stayed there, and then the UN came back, and they brought some fuel for a truck that the church had. We all piled into that truck and took us down to Port-au-Prince, directly to the airport. I, I did stay with Gene, but at the time I talked to Alex, and, and we were trying to decide who would be best to go and who would be best to stay, and, uh, and um, so we just decided that that I would stay with Jean. She was badly injured, I, and I, I really still don't know. I, th I thought she was going to make it home. I, I, I was surprised. The the ladies at my office are pretty. Um, They've uh, uh, embraced this whole situation. I call back to the church because the church, uh, Highland Park, was the hub for communication, which worked beautifully. Um, and they said that what we were supposed to do was just stay there. And so we waited and we waited. I finally looked out the, the side door of the plane and here came a car with Lila and Dr. Faree in it. And wow, what a, a an amazing sight that was. And it was amazing feeling, an absolutely amazing feeling. I thought, we may get home. We really may get home. I think there's no question that the opening or the reopening of the eye clinic is an integral part of our future and where we're headed missionally. But we're in the business of conveying the message of resurrection. I mean, that's what being a Christian is all about. And I don't know of a category in our ministry where that is truly lived out more vividly than what's happening with the reopening of the eye clinic. It's important for it to rebuild because it is our history. We can't possibly with any integrity celebrate 100 years of, uh, of ministry without uh, realizing that some of our great projects need to be uh, continued and started back up. I think rebuilding the clinic is a way of showing that we take our evangelism seriously. I mean, I, I can't imagine us not uh, cont continuing. It, it is who we are. I mean, look at it. I mean, that's almost 50, that's almost half. That's, all, that's unbelievable. Almost half of our church's history is, is wrapped up in, in, in the Haiti Project. If we had just walked away from it and not rebuilt the clinic, we would have essentially been saying, here are the words, but we're not committed. This is our way, I think, of showing the people in Haiti that we really, that we're committed, and hopefully that by seeing our commitment, that that's a way of sharing God's love with them in a way that we could never do with words or sending checks. There are times of joy, time of sadness. But God says in Jesus Christ, the light will come again. He will shine on us, in us, so those whose eyes will be open again. Our well-being will be not only physically, but spiritually. May God bless you and keep you now and forevermore. It never ceases to amaze me how far-reaching uh, this church is, whether it's the sick or the hungry or shut-ins or our own families who have certain challenges and special needs children or a habitat build, what have you. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable community that we have and the generosity is so deep and reaches so far.
as an institution, I want to be generous to those areas, not just where we're talking about Christ, but where we're living out Christ in the world. I want our church to be generous, and I want our individual members to be generous, because this is an area where we're living it out. I want our church to constantly be in pursuit of how do we convey the story of resurrection. I don't know a better way to do it than to get behind this eye clinic and make sure that it keeps on having life.